No matter if you're shooting mono or color with a dual narrowband filter, this tutorial is for you. And why it is different from the other estimated 2 million narrowband tutorials on YouTube, I will explain you right after the trailer. Hey, this is View Into Space. I'm Sasha from Switzerland, so grüezi miteinander and thanks for watching my channel. So given I'm asking you to spend quite a long time with me now for this narrowband tutorial, I want to first up explain what makes it worthwhile, what makes it so special. I think there's three reasons. The first one is the way we treat the stars, that we treat them completely separately and also strive to get the highest quality from the stars. Second, I see a lot of tutorials where people are still using screen transfer function for stretching and stuff like that. And why this might look sexy and fast in a tutorial, it is definitely not the best praxis to get the best results. And in this tutorial, we will use exclusively the best solutions for everything to get to the highest result as possible. And I think the third point is that I try to get as much knowledge as possible, be it through all the individual processes that I already evaluated, be it on watching endless tutorials from other people and trying to understand where the signal advantages lie and consolidate it to a pool of best practices. So I don't want to state that everything I'll teach you in this tutorial is based on my inventions. It obviously can't be. There's a lot of people who have great ideas and all I do is try to collect and consolidate that all together. So with that, let's get started. Let's first discuss what narrowband is and what the different options are to get to a narrowband picture. So the first and obviously most elegant and most exclusive method is to shoot mono and then shoot with a HA filter, an O3 filter and an S2 filter. So we have three pictures at the end, all with the highest possible quality exposed. Now the next option is that you shoot with a color camera in combination with a dual narrowband filter, means you collect HA and O3 data with the filter and you can split that afterwards. And the splitting can be happen in two ways. If you're using AstroPixel processor, then it offers a function to split it right through the stacking and you end up with a dedicated HA and O3 exposure. The other option is you stack the whole thing as one and then in PixInsight, you actually do channel extraction and then the red channel is the HA and the green and the blue channel combined is the O3 and you end up again with two different exposures. And you realize that in this case, we don't gather the S2. And this is why this method is called HOO, as we replace the S2 with another O3. Last but not least, you might have heard it that ASCAR releases a color magic filter, which is a dual narrowband filter who gathers O3 and S2 data. So in combination with a traditional dual narrowband filter, you can then also cover all three channels. And I will create a dedicated tutorial to this method as soon as I get the filter. So no matter what method you're using, you need at least for this tutorial, an HA and an O3 exposure. If you have an S2, that's great, but not absolutely necessary. What else do we need? We also need a luminance picture. Now luminance means in principle, just the brightness information. So it's not about the color, it's just how bright is it? And what we're taking from the luminance is the detail. And there's two different philosophies. On one side, you could only use the HA picture because usually most of the object is covered by HA, or you could be using the whole combined picture. I personally root with the people who state to use the whole combined picture as luminance. And the reasoning for me is simple, that HA does not cover everything. So there are areas which are really O3 dominated, for example. And if you don't have this as luminance, it's hard for me to grasp how it should work. So personally, what you will also see in my tutorial, I will use a luminance channel of the whole combined picture as luminance. And I will show you how to create that 
when we are in Pixel Insight. And now, just that you see how it piles up, we are already by three to four exposures, which you need. The three channels plus luminance. And then there are the stars. And as mentioned at the start, I recommend to completely deal with the stars separately, to shoot them separately and to process them separately. And for that, if you have not done it yet, please have a look at my star tutorial, where I will explain you the whole process of getting the most out of your stars. And with that, we are by four to five exposures, which you will deal with separately. And at the end, all will be combined to one picture. So in this tutorial, we're dealing with the traditional narrowband method, which means we stay as close as possible to the reality. HA is red, how it is in nature. O3 is blue, how it is in nature. And then we deviate with the S2 where available and we assign it to green for the sake that we can actually differentiate it within the picture. And that's the only thing which kind of deviates from nature. Otherwise, S2 is also red. You would not even realize it's there. Now there are many other coloring versions like the Hubble palette, and I will deal with all of them in another separate tutorial. Now the last question you might have is, why should I do it it's so complicated? I've just seen your RGB tutorial and that looks good. So why should I take all this effort? And my answer would be, let's wait until the end. Just go through it once, compare it, and then you can decide for yourself. And that you can compare it. We use the exact same picture as I also used for the RGB tutorial, because I want to give you a chance to see the difference at the end, that you can really compare the two methods side by side, and then decide for yourself, this additional effort, is it worth it or not? And with that, let's go to PixInsight. So let's see what we have here already on the screen. Here we have the stars. I already went through the steps described in the star tutorial and that's the outcome. So they're ready to be combined at the end. On the other side, I have what I need from the Nebula. I myself did it in AstroPixel processor. So I asked AstroPixel processor to create me an HA image. That's this one. Then an O3 image. That's this one. And you can easily see how they look different. For example, here in the HA, you see very nice this part of the nebula. This is for almost non-existent here in the O3, but we have a lot more in this area where we have nothing here. Last but not least, this is the luminance. So in my case, what this actually is, it's a mono picture of all the data that I gather with the dual narrowband filter. And AstroPixel processor can also create that right away. Now, if you have a color picture and you need a luminance picture, that's really easy. All you have to do in PixInsight is you go to Image, Extract, and here Lightness. And when you click that, you get automatically a luminance picture. So these four pictures, that's what we are going to work with in this tutorial. Some of you might have a fifth picture, the S2 exposure, and I will mention that where actually our path deviate. So the very first thing we have now to do is to register all pictures together. So we have to ensure that they fit on top of each other. And this is so crucial because afterwards, we're going to remove the stars of these pictures. And from the moment on, we remove the stars, there's no way back. If they're not registered, if they do not fit, we will have to start from scratch again. So how do we do that? We go to a process which is called star alignment. We have now to pick a reference picture. And as the stars obviously have the most stars, and also given that this picture is already cropped, we choose this as the reference picture. So the reference picture is the one which will not be changed. And you have seen by drag and drop, I put this in here. So the next thing is we drag and drop the rest of the pictures to the target image. One, two, three. There's nothing else to do here except clicking 
the circle apply global. Okay, that's done. We got three new pictures. With that, we can close the star alignment process and we can close our all pictures. The new ones have now all this suffix registered. When we look at them now, what strikes our eye is that they're now neatly cropped. And that is obviously because I cropped this one before. So that is now done too, because it just took now the size of the star picture. And they now all fit neatly over the stars. Now in your case, especially if the star picture is not finalized yet, then it might be that they're not cropped yet. So they still have these black borders because of the stacking errors. If that's the case, that's now the moment where you will crop them. And even I don't have to do it here, I will show you how we choose dynamic crop. And let's say I would start now to crop this picture here. So for example, like this, I would like to crop it. The crucial part is that you do not immediately execute it, but that you take the triangle and put it to the background here. Now you can execute. And once you have done that, I will obviously not do it now here. Then you close this process and you go to the next picture and then you open this store process and you see it opens exactly the same dimension which you cropped before. And that's how you can do it now one and every picture until every picture has the same size. And it's absolutely crucial that you crop this way because if you would crop differently then you would lose the registration again and all would be lost in principle at the end. With that, we do not need the stars anymore until practically the end where we will combine the nebula, which we're working on now, with the stars. So for the moment, I say goodbye to the stars and they go here until we need them. Now, the next question we have to discuss is when do we do the combination of these pictures? And the first one will be the color combination. So AJ with O3. And there's obviously a lot of different possibilities. For example, we could do it right now. It makes our life very easy, then everything has only to be done once. The other extreme, we can go with each picture through all the different processes and only after we stretched them, then we call it combine them. You could argue this has the advantage that you can really tailor the needs for each of these exposures and also stretch them optimally and only then they will be combined. Now personally I'm somewhere in the middle and so what I want to do separately is the background extraction because depending on the channel you might have different gradients and if you can tackle them separately channel by channel you have a better chance to extract all the possible background issues than when you do it combined. But after the background extraction, I'm actually quite happy to combine them. Because on one side, I want to be able to do a spectrophotometric color calibration, which you can obviously only do once you have them color combined. And I definitely want to do the color calibration before the stretch. The other thing is that I feel that I can stretch better when I actually see the color. Now what really helps here is that I can get rid of the stars because when you do it like that, the stars will look ridiculous and you will see that. And it might be hard to actually get them back to something decent, but as we anyway do not use the stars here, I can just throw them away and you will see that all now. So as mentioned, next step, dynamic background extraction. So we get that here, background modelization and dynamic background extraction. Now I would suggest that you start with the luminance as you have here all the issues combined in one picture. So we click on there, we set the first initial sample, given there are not so many stars. I will now increase the sample radius to about 30. I will click resize all. And now let's just add some nice samples. Okay, once I set them all, I will have to go up with the tolerance. So let's say 2.5 is a number I usually like to, to do. Let's see now. Now also you see these two which were red, which were not considered, they're considered now. We have no extreme black area, so we don't have to go up with the shadow relaxation. But this is all quite easy stuff, so we want to have it smooth. So we go up with the smoothing factor. Let's put it on 0.7. Target image correction. 
These are mostly easy gradients, so we go to subtraction and that's all what we need to do. Now don't execute, wait, take the triangle, put it on the background. Because also here we can use these samples again because they do not change. They don't need to change because the stars, the nebulosity is at the same place in all of the three pictures. So we don't want to do the work of the sampling three times. We want to do it once. Now, once we have done that, we can actually execute and it's done. Let's look at a picture. That looks nice. All the gradients are gone. We can also look here at the background map. And now for the moment, usually I discard them, but for the moment, let's keep it. Let's close the process down. Let's close this picture. We don't need it anymore. So now we go to the HA. So we open now this process and you see what happens? We all have them here. So all we have to do now is execute. And that's the cool part. Again, we're getting here the background extracted part. Looking good. Let's minimize it. Let's look at the background map. And you see how it looks different. And if you put them on top of each other, you nicely see how they differ. Let's close now this one. Now let's also do that with the O3. Get going. Here we are. Let's also here have a look. That looks good. Gradient is gone. And that's how this gradient is looking. Okay. So now that we have done the background extraction, we go to the next step. And that is the color combination. Now the trick to do a good color combination is they should be the same bright. Because if they're not the same bright, then one will actually take over and we will have an unnatural colorization on it. So how do we do that? We go to process, color calibration and linear fit. In linear fit, we have to define a reference image. And at the moment, we don't know yet which one is the reference and which one do we change. And for that, we need another tool called another process called statistics. And you find this in image statistics. So let's now choose first HA and we see that the median is 75.4 if you choose here 16 bit. So we remember the 75.4 and we go now to the O3. And you can see that now we have a much darker median, only 34.5. And the darker exposure is the reference. So we know now that the O3 is our reference. So we take here the writer, put it in reference image. Now we take the triangle and throw it on the HA. Or can you see how dark it actually got? But if we stretch again, they look the same again practically. If I now choose the HA, you can see here median 34.6. So we have now the same median for the O3 and the HA. With that, the linear fit is done. They're both the same bright. So we can now call it combine them. For that, we go to process, color spaces, LRGB combination. Here we deselect the luminance. We're not yet including the luminance. Obviously for red, it's HA. And then for blue, it's O3. And now with green, we're deviating. If you have an S2 exposure, you put it in here. And if you don't have one, you take the O3 and put it in here. And that's why it's called H O O because we use the O for the green and for the blue. We select the chrominance noise reduction. And now we're executing and let's look at it. Okay, and here we are. Now there's a few things to say about this picture. A, it doesn't really look natural. That might have different reasons. There's definitely too much blue in here. And that's a little bit the disadvantage of this HOO. If you're working here with sulfur, yours will look much more decent because if we're actually adding the oxygen twice, then it just overreaches. And that's what you see here. So that's one of the issue. Second issue, the stars. You see them, they look horrific. And I can already tell you as a spoiler, even if we would use this here and if we color calibrate it, we actually get to a decent result with the nebula. With the stars, we don't. <laughs> they stay blue. So this is also why I said it's, it's a huge advantage if you can simply say without any regret, I will throw these stars away. And I use my separate set, which are beautiful, 
which are natural. So we could use now this picture, but there is a better way. The good part here about the LRGB combination is that you can actually weight the channels. So we could say now that we go with blue a little bit down to about 95 and green, which we anyway don't like that much. We go down to about 85. Okay. And now let's see again. And yeah, you see that looks much more balanced. It's okay. It is very colorful. That's okay. But we have now it less greenish. We have the red more pronounced. That's something we can work with. So we leave it at that. We close this monster here down. We do not need the channel exposures anymore. This is now what we're working on. So the next thing we're going to do is the spectrophotometric color calibration. And for that, as you know, we need to have the picture plate solved. So for that, first of all, we need to have the information that are needed in here. How we do that, we get to a process called FITS header. That's here. I take a single exposure right from Nina and I select it here. And here I have all the metadata that I need for the plate solving. Then I take the triangle and throw it on here and it's done. So now all the metadata that is needed for the image solver is now contained in this image. So short and sweet. Next thing we go to script, image analysis and image solver. Given that all the metadata is now contained, it immediately displays it. We have to do nothing except of executing this script. So it has plate solved now my picture. It's fine. And now I can go into SPCC, which I find here under spectrophotometry, spectrophotometric color calibration. So what do we have to choose? White reference. For narrow band, we have to choose photon flux. Don't ask me why. They tell me to do that. I'll do it. QE curve. We leave to ideal QE curve and not to the sensor of our camera. Again, that's what's in the manual. That's what I'm doing. Then we select narrowband filter mode. And here it's HOO for me. So I choose here the wavelength and the bandwidth is five nanometers for my Antlia ALPT. So that's fine now too. For the background neutralization, I would recommend to actually choose a background because we have here a lot of nebulosity. So I will say preview and let me see. Here we have a nice piece of background which is not impacted by any nebula. It doesn't matter if a few little stars are in there, that's fine. So I choose region of interest from preview. And here we go. With that, everything is set. So for the people who say this is complicated, it's not as complicated as you think it is. So we throw now the triangle on there. Okay, and it's done. And as you can see, the points are mostly in the line. So that's fine. Some people wonder why down here we do not have any points. And the reason is this is blue green. And given that we actually use the same channel for blue and green here, obviously it's meaningless. So whenever you shoot narrow band, only oxygen and HA, you only have one graph. That's, that's by design, that's fine. So we close this here, we stretch this now, and now you see what I mean. This looks decent now, right? It's not, not as horrific anymore as before. The color looks realistic. We have now a lot of red here. We still see the blue. But also what I told you about the stars. <laughs> we still have all these green bluish stars in here, which are just horrific. And you don't get that away. So the next thing we are going to do is we use SCNR just to get a little bit rid of the greenish tone. Now, personally, I do not use the official SCNR, which you would find in processes, but I use the one of Bill Blanchon. I really like all the pixel mass processes that Bill creates, and I use a lot of them, and I will put them in the description below. So let's now throw that on here. And you can see that it's now slightly less greenish, looks much nicer, and it preserves the luminance, which is the big advantage of this special SCNR of Bill. With that, we're finally, finally at a moment where we can say goodbye to this disgrace of stars. So you can do that with Starnet++ 
or you can do it with the star exterminator. I personally use both processes, the star exterminator and the noise exterminator. From my perspective, the star exterminator is obviously superior to the star Net plus plus, but from a distance point of view, it's not as big as with the noise exterminator. And that's a little bit the point. The noise exterminator, I feel that's a must buy. There's nothing which only closely compares to it. And then when you already have bought the noise exterminator, you get the star exterminator with a discount and then it's actually worth buying it too. So we do not need a generate star image because we will not use these stars. So we can simply throw the triangle on there and say, hasta la vista stars. We only want to keep the nebula. Okay. And our stars are gone. Doesn't it look nice? much nicer than before. Now you might have already forgotten about it, but down here we have the luminance picture, right? And you know what? We also do not want any stars at the luminance picture, so we also remove them here. Okay, and by the way, you see on both pictures, we have some issues up here. So there's some of my very horrific, eggy stars, which the star exterminator could not identify as stars. This is not the problem of the star exterminator. This is my problem with my back focus or tilting issue, whatever it is. So how do we deal with that? We can either let them be or we can delete them. And especially in the luminance, at least getting rid of the biggest one is definitely not a bad idea. For that, we go to process, painting and clone stamp. So I enlarge now the picture a bit that I can really see what I'm doing. I go into clone stamp, let's select the picture. So I increase now the radius to about 30 and hope that's good enough. I'm not a huge fan of the clone stamp. It's quite clumsy compared to what Photoshop or any other picture processing software would actually offer, but well, it is as it is, right? We select with the control click where we want to take the sample from. Now we go to the star and we eliminate it. Same way we eliminate this one and this one and so on. Okay, and when we're ready, we click the green hook and it's done and we can close the clone stamp. With that, let's come to the next process, which I already mentioned and that's the noise exterminator you find this one on the process noise reduction noise exterminator and we simply let it run over the luminance one and also over the color one and it's done and looks really nice and with that we're ready for stretching and we have to stretch both pictures now so we start with the color one and the way i stretch and the way i would recommend that you stretch here in intensity transformation, you find the generalized hyperbolic stretch. At the present time, some people have it on the processes, some people don't. It's a little bit of chaos. If you cannot find it under process, you can still download the script. And the script is as good, if not better, than the process, so you're not missing out on anything. Main thing is, you have the generalized hyperbolic stretch it doesn't really matter if it's on process or on the script side. The generalized hyperbolic stretch is exactly on the opposite scale of the screen transfer function. It's the most sophisticated way how you can stretch and also the one which takes obviously the most effort, but it really pays off. And it's not an easy task here. And I would suggest that you watch a dedicated tutorial just for the generalized hyperbolic stretches. And there's amazing tutorials out there, not from me, from other people, which are quite lengthy, but it's really worth working yourself into the capability of this tool. But I will show you now the general way how it's done. So the first thing we're doing, we actually disable now the screen transfer function so that the picture is black. Then we go in on the plus sign, we click here, and now we actually see the histogram. We're now going about to the middle of this curve because that's where we want to stretch. And we click on it 
and we get this yellow line. Once we have this yellow line set, this is the value that it actually represents, we go to send to SP. We click it, and now the value is sent down here to the symmetry point. So that defines now where the stretch is actually happening. With that, we can undo this, the zoom here with the zoom one to one, and that's fine again. Next thing is we go to the local intensity and we put it up to about nine-ish. That's the intensity of the stretch and given it's the first stretch we're doing now, we go up pretty high. Next thing, we need a preview. Here we have it. And now we go to the stretch factor and we start stretching. And you see now how here the graph starts to move. And we move them to right about 20%, which is around here. You see now the nipple are very weak. That's okay. And we execute the stretch. So now we obviously have to reset again. Now without the zoom, we already see the curve. We again put this line in the middle. That's fine. Send to SP like before. Now the local intensity, given that it's the second time, we put it only to about five. And now we start to stretch again. And that's about good for the second time. We execute again. We reset. We again set a line. Can now say we want to stretch a little bit on the lower end here. Send to SP. Now this time we only go to about three. And we continue stretching. And now you see the beauty that unfolds. So let's not go too high. But I think that should be about good. Let's compare it. We can also protect the highlights in that we put this lever here a little bit back. You also see what happens. So I think that looks pretty good. So we will execute that. And now there's a last step which we're doing. We change now from generalized hyperbolic to linear which is now the screen transformation or the histogram transformation. So the traditional stretch. And what you see here is this line low clip. So as soon as we enter here something, something on the low end gets clipped. And what I do, I go to the lowest number and I just replace it by one, change to something else. And you see how it instantly gets darker. So that is the first time that something gets clipped and i don't say i leave it at that but that gives me the maximum darkness that i can actually do without clipping now i go to the black point and i change it now back to a little bit brighter until i'm happy and i think that looks about good i execute that and with that the stretching has happened so i close the preview and here we have our stretch picture. Now that we've finished stretching this one, we can also stretch our luminance shot. And here, as before with the color channels, it's crucial that both have the same brightness. But we cannot work here with linear fit. What we do here is simply, what we do here is simply rely on the process statistics while we do the stretching. So I get now here the process statistics. I choose my stretched RGB image and I look for the median and I get it here by color channel. And if I average that, I'm somewhere around 14,000, I would say. So I should aim when I stretch now the luminance also to get to around 14,000. So we keep that in mind. I'm now also opening for this one here, the generalized hyperbolic stretch, and we proceed in exactly the same way as we did before. So. We reset the screen transfer function. We zoom in, mark the middle of the curve, send to SP. We get to nine with the local intensity. We open a preview and we stretch again until we are about here. We execute, we reset, we set again, send to SP. Now we go to a five. So we do all exactly the same as before. Then we stretch again, that's nice. Execute, reset. We check now in statistics where we are. We change now to the luminance and we see we are already at 13.5. So we are practically there. That's good to know. For the third time, we might focus a little bit on the darker areas. Send to SP. Just go now to a three and we start again. Stretch a bit. And crucial is here 
with the luminance that we do not overdo it because you see what we're what the luminance is crucial for is the structures and if we're now stretching too much the structures are gone <laughs> so we're here it's really less is more we just do this little tiny bit like this but the structures are very nicely visible so let's execute that now we're at 14 130 so that's great again as before what we also can now do is we go to linear low clip which is that one obviously we do not want to have it that dark let's go up again compare it just this little additional darkness that's fine we'll leave it with that here so the stretching is here also done now given that we have now already this picture in front of us let's finish it up there's one last step here which we need and that is to sharpen it a tiny little bit and that's kind of a really delicate task the issue is the following with the luminance we get the details so if we leave it like that it's too blurry if we sharpen it up too much also the result will will not look good so it needs the right amount of sharpness that we get also the expected effect out of it so if we open now the unsharp mask let's have here a preview we're now here at a 2.5 Let's look at it. And that's kind of what I like. Gives me a little bit more structure. It definitely gives a little bit more sharpness, but it's not radical and that's good. So I will apply that. And just to show you now, this would be in a sharpening again, and this would now be too much. You see, you have now really like lines and this destroys the whole appearance of the nebulosity. So this is something we would not want. So let's close now on sharp filter and we're actually happy and ready with the luminance, but only with the luminance. Now there's still much more work ahead of us with the RGB picture. And so the first thing we will actually do, funny enough, is we will use now the luminance picture, which we already have, as a mask. So we will throw it on here. So what you can see now, the whole background is protected and only the nebula is visible but we want exactly the opposite for a start so we will go here on this icon invert mask and now the nebula is protected but the background is not and that's what we want so we will make now the filter invisible so that we actually see what we're doing and we're opening the curve transformation here we go so what we do now is we create a darker background let's have a preview and let's go down here and you can see it has a minimal effect on the nebulosity, but it has a substantial effect on the background. We want to have this rather dark. And we might also desaturate the background a tiny little bit. Okay, that's good. We execute that, done. Let's put a reset on it. And for the moment, that's all we want to actually do with the luminance mask. So now to go on, we need column masks. And there are different ways how to create them. My way is, as always, I call Bill. And Bill Blanchon has actually created scripts for each of these column masks. And the amazing part is that all you have to do is you throw the triangle on the picture you want to have the mask for, and he creates it for you. And here it is already. So that's the red in my picture. So I throw it on here, select it now. I have a look. And I see that the background is protected and my nebula is not. And so this is exactly what I want. So I hide it now. And I go now here on the curve transfer also to red. Create a preview. And now let's see. Let's increase that a little bit. And when we compare it, you might realize that the red is just this tiny little bit more pronounced now. Now, given that the red is already quite pronounced, we do not have to do that that much. We can also check the saturation curve, see what's happening if you also increase this slightly. So that looks nice, pops a little bit more, but not too much. So from my point of view, that's okay. Execute that. Let's close preview, reset the whole thing. And what we need now is a blue mask. Hey Bill, I need a blue mask. Let's see, here it is. Throw it on there. And here is my blue mask. Let's put it on the picture. It's done. If you want to check if it really worked, you can always go to mask, select mask, and now you see blue mask. So that's fine. Let's have a look on it, that it really 
did it right where yes the background is protected the blue is not protected that's what we want so again we need a preview we click now here on blue and we start the same game with the blue so the blue given that it's not that pronounced yet we want to give it a substantial push let's have a look that can be even more we can also work with the saturation going up with that one too let's look again from my perspective it can even be a little bit more yeah now it's nice now the blue is really quite visible if you feel that you still have some kind of a green tone in here which you dislike what you can do now while you're at the blue you can go on green you can try it now if it has any effect you can go down with the green and you see actually it has an effect let me see before and after and this is now a question of taste let's be very clear what we're doing right now has nothing to do anymore with reality or with science this is artistic we're altering the picture to make it look more beautiful or if you want to put it in any scientific term you can say you do it like that so that actually the o3 emission for example is better visible and here you have it now we're doing it again in the name of science but just between you and me this is art but there's nothing bad about that but just saying if you want to have it a little bit more greenish a little bit more bluish up to you so i like that as it is right now so i execute again and that's done we can close now the preview so we're eliminating now the mask and we have actually finished the masked paste tasks at least on this picture here there's one last step which we will do now and which at first glance might look counterintuitive to you for that we go to convolution convolution and while you might have heard of deconvolution of stars by the way which i'm not doing at all because i don't see the point but this is the opposite what this is is actually blurring what we're doing now and as i said it sounds counterintuitive because we have now such a nice picture and actually what we're doing now we're destroying it so we get to a preview and now you see your standard deviation we increase that now to about a level of 15 i would say it's blurred out and we say okay do it we don't want to have it anymore that's fine so why did we do that now the point is remember what we said is the luminance picture this one holds all the detail and how you have to imagine it what we're de doing now we're filling all this white with the right color but the details are according to this picture and to ensure that we're not getting detail on top of detail especially if there still might be a minute variation we want to have it blurred out and with that the next step is the combination of the color with the luminance for that once more we select the lrgb combination we're now deselecting the color channels and we're adding the luminance drag and drop here to the luminance channel with that done we activate the chrominance noise re reduction and we throw the triangle on the color picture and here we go with a lot of detail a lot of color we have now here the picture with which we continue now are you okay with this you might be or you might not be again there's always a lot of factor playing into each other and we're not at the end yet so you feel this is too colorful you can desaturate it you feel it's too dark you can make it brighter and i think that's also something crucial i want to mention here this workflow which i show you now has a huge amount of different steps and different processes and you're not obliged to use any of those so i show you here the full options that you have to actually work on your pictures but depending on what object you're working on what the situation was if you have an s2 or not you know there's so many things which at the end define what you actually need to get your final picture but this is the full range that i show you now that you could use so let's do that a little bit bigger and so the next thing we're doing we again take the luminance and we throw it as a mask on the picture at the moment we want to continue work with the nebula not the background so we have a peak and yes it's the nebula who actually is not protected so that's good 
With that, we want to see that we get the whole thing a little bit brighter. And for that, we choose the exponential transformation process. It's here. Let's give us a preview. And you can nicely see how it brightens the thing up. Can we go a little bit higher? Remember, less is more. So at the end, I think about 1.5 gives a lot more glow without actually emphasizing the background. This function anyway protects the background. And in addition, we have the mask on. So you see the effects on the background are minimal, but it really lets the nebula glow. So that's really nice. So I will execute that. And we are one step closer. We still have the mask on and we leave it on. The next thing we want to see if we actually can increase the contrast a tiny little bit and if that helps. And by the way, you might ask why I did not do that on the luminance where I also did the uncharred mask. And my experience is that if you do it at this point of time, the results will not be good. I did not really like it. There's some things which are easier to see when you see it in color. Let's put it like this. So contrast in PixInsight is called local histogram equalization. Don't ask me why, but that's what it is. So again, we want a preview. We want to mostly deal with the large structures. So we go up to about 150 here with a kernel radius. With that, we actually deal with the large structures. The contrast limit at the start, it's usually two. I usually go down to 1.3. That's my magic number. That's how it looks like full blown. It's usually too strong. Tone it a little bit down and let's have a look at it. And you see also slightly, it just enhances the contrast without really destroying the picture. So that's nice. Let's apply that. And that's done. So reset the whole thing. Let's now go down to small structures. Let's say about a 50. Again, let's go down to 1.3. Let's just look what it does. And you see that there's a lot more details. For example, look around here. If I now turn it off, turn it on again, the structure of the nebula is much more visible. But again, we want to tone this down way too much. We don't want to destroy the picture. I don't even know if you see it through YouTube, but it's just a tiny little bit. We're also activating that. Okay. And that's done. And that's done. So we're now almost finished. And before we now combine it with the stars, let's open again the curve transformation. We reset that. We get a preview. Now there's two things I want to do. The first thing, quite honestly, it's just a tiny little bit too intense color wise. So let's go to saturation and just tone it down equally a little tiny bit. And I think that's okay. That looks much better. So let's execute that. So that was one thing. Let's reset it. So the second thing I want to do, I want to get the background just a tiny little bit darker about like this. We might even push the nebula a little bit more from a brightness point of view. Let's have a look at it. From my point of view, it looks much better. Let's execute that too. And now I'm actually happy with it. So that's now really, really nice. And now we actually bring back our stars here, which just waited patiently now until we're finished with the nebula. But before we combine them now, what we're going to do is we go to process, mask generation, range selection. I want to have a preview. It's white. And the only thing I want to have protected is really the core of the nebulosity. Something like this here. I might do that a little bit fuzzy, a little bit smooth. And I would say, yeah, that's about it. I will execute that now. Preview can go away. Here it is. And I throw it on it. And that's how it looks. Now I have to invert it. Okay, so the nebula is protected, the rest not. Why I'm doing that? Because I do not want to have stars in my primary nebula. That just looks odd and it just disturbs from the nebula. I love stars and I want to have them in my picture and I want to have them as beautiful as possible in my picture, but I do not want to disturb them, my main object. And so that's why I protect it. 
And you might ask, why do you not use a luminance mask as you use now all the time before? And the reason is that the luminance mask also has some protection of the background. That's just how it works. And that would actually diminish also our stars all over the picture. And this is not what we want. We really only want to protect the nebula. And that's what we achieve now. So now it's time to combine the two picture. And for that, we use the power of pixel math. As you can see, this is the formula that I use to integrate the stars. And this is, by the way, the same, just the inverse formula, which star X terminate uses to externalize the stars. So from that point, we're doing exactly the opposite. And that's much, much better than just using starless plus stars, which creates a lot of issues. So obviously what do we have to do now? Double click here and say this one is starless. And then we go to this here and we call this one stars. With that, we're ready. Are you ready? Let's push apply on it. Here we go. Let's pull back the curtain, delete the mask. And here we go. Now, before we completely say this is it, for a very, very last time, we open again, you guessed it, the curve transformation. Let's give us a preview. Let's reset it. And let's just see. Kind of just make it a little bit darker in the background, a little bit more. And this is very much now, again, very individual taste. I like it very dark in the background. Others like it not so dark. This is up to you. You see? Pops much more, much more contrast. I like that. Good. Let's execute that and let's call it a day. And now we come to the question. As you know, I did the exact same picture with the RGB process, which is much less work. So was it worth it? The stars are exactly the same. I used exactly the same stars, exactly the same picture as the background. All that changed is the foreground, the nebula. So let's now open the picture and now you can compare yourself. Isn't that a huge difference? Look at that, all the blue, which we have here only a little bit these, these shapes. This is mostly red and white with a tiny little bit of blue. And here we have all these blue and it's so much more prominent. For example, here, this nebula is almost not visible. And here, all these O3 nebulosity is very nicely visible. And look at this area here, how spectacular it is with the three colors intertwined. There's much less wow here. So personally, comparing the two pictures, yes, it's a lot more work, but also the output is just on a complete different level. So with that, we're at the end of our journey. I hope it was possible to follow me along to go through the steps. And if you have any questions, please leave it in the comments below. And I'm more than happy to elaborate more and if, to give you more tips and tricks to make this work out. All the processes, all the scripts that I use in here, you will find in the links in the description below. Wow, you're still here? Really? That's amazing. Thanks a lot for staying with me through this endless tutorial. If you followed along, I hope the results that you got was actually worth it and that in the future this really brings some great value. And as always, if you liked the video, please give me a like and press the subscribe button below. There's more tutorials to come. See you next time and clear skies.